Uh, g'day, welcome everyone. Um, my name's Alec, I'm one of the regulars here at Night Church. I'm Andy, a uh, special welcome if you're new here tonight, and special welcome if this is your hundredth time coming tonight. We love seeing you, uh, but we'd love for you to grab your pen, your Bible, and download the sermon outline from church website. Uh, it's on there. Yeah, feel free to grab that. Yep. Yeah. Um, and tonight is actually um, exciting because tonight is our final pre-recorded online service. So it's the last time, um, hopefully the last time that we'll be doing it uh, in this sort of setup. Perfect. Um, but that also means that, you know, next week we'll be back in person, which is really exciting. Um, and this week is on top of all that excitement is the start of a brand new series. Uh, so we're going to be starting on the book of Daniel. Uh, and this week, James is going to be giving us uh, an overview to help us um, really started off right by having the context where it fits in the Bible, history, uh, all that good stuff. Perfect. Yeah. yeah I'm going to pray for tonight. So if you'd love to bow your heads with me. Yeah. Uh, Lord, yeah, thank you that we can open your word together. Uh, if that's, yeah, at the couch at home or uh, surrounded by our friends at church. Lord, I pray, yeah, that we're growing in your word. I pray for James as he brings it to us. Yeah, that we can be yeah, continually growing to be more like your son. Amen. Amen. Thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain, fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither to thy help I'm come, and I hope by safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. To grace, how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy goodness like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to thee Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy cause above. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy cause above. Uh, g'day everyone, uh, Michael and James here with just a bit of a ministry update, particularly about what's going to be happening from the 2nd of August, which is next week. Uh, James, over the last few weeks we've started meeting in our buildings in smaller numbers uh, in the morning and at night. How's that been for you? I, I've absolutely loved it. Mm. Uh, the work's been done a lot by you and the tech team. Uh, it's up front and I just come in and can talk to people 1.5 metres apart and... Um, <laughs> Uh, it's just been really sort of the essential Bible done and let's talk to each other, physical church. It's been fantastic. Uh, 
Next week, though, it's going to be a little bit different. You're going to be back up front preaching live. Uh, I think you're on next week. Pretty sure that's right. Yeah. I'm going on holiday, so I think it's him. Uh, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit what's August 2nd going to look like for Engadine Morning Church? Yeah, so uh, there is a time change. It's 10 o'clock and uh, we're really encouraging everyone who can to come back in. Uh, for those who can't, there will be a camera up back. It won't, won't be as polished, but it'll, uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be still streamed uh, to the airwaves. Uh, but 10 o'clock in the building, 9 and 1040 of have been combined online uh, at, at, well, and Heathcote at 9 o'clock going live. Uh, but from 10 o'clock next week in the Ingerdean building, it's going to be uh, for adults, got to register your families, uh, unless Gladys changes something <laughs> this week, uh, it's, it's going to be capped, of course. And then we're going to uh, have kids program and Ian's on duty for that and get, get all, got all the teams up and running. Also for youth, just yeah. to be off site, and give us a bit more number capping in, in the building. Uh, meeting at my house, and uh, so you'll have to drop them off up there uh, first. Alrighty, so that's Engadine mornings, 10 a.m. in the building, register yep. online. Uh, night church is gonna keep happening at 6 p.m. and we'll be live as well. Uh, so again, register in the building, uh, register to come and join us in the building. Uh, but we'll also be live streaming the 6 p.m. service uh, with the camera at the back. So uh, like James said, it might not be quite so polished and no doubt we're going to hit some speed bumps along the way as sure. we figure it all out again. Uh, but uh, for those who aren't able to yet rejoin us as we reopen, uh, you'll still be able to watch uh, from home without, uh, in exactly the same way that you have been. For Heathcote, uh, we're going to oh. do things a little bit differently. Uh, so on August 2, next Sunday, uh, come and join the Engadine Morning Church or even Night Church if you like. Uh, there'll be no one in the building on August 2. But August 9th, we're going to uh, reopen Heathcote. So at 9.30, like we normally do at Heathcote, uh, we'll meet to, uh, to pray together and to read the passage in advance of the sermon. Uh, and then at about 10 o'clock, we'll switch on the TV screens uh, and we will uh, watch the sermon live streamed out of Engadine uh, and then we'll get rid of them uh, at the end of the sermon and do our own thing uh, down at Heathcote. So that's, that's the plans from August 9th. Uh, but again, you'll be able to watch it all online uh, at 10 a.m. Uh, if you've got any questions about any of that, that's a lot of information and rambling from us. Uh, just uh, jump on the website or send us an email uh, and we'll, we'll help you out with all of that. I'm looking forward to it. We'll see you in the building, yeah. unless Gladys has got other ideas. See you later. Bye. Hi, I'm Elise from Night Church, and I'm going to pray now if you would like to join me. Dear Heavenly Father, you are our all-powerful, loving God, who in your gracious mercy sent your Son to die, so that through him we may be saved and brought back into a right relationship with you. Despite this, we so often fail to recognize you as our ruler, the king of our lives. We are sorry for the times we turn away from you, and we ask you now for forgiveness. Throughout this year, we have constantly been reminded that you are in control of all things, not us. Please help us to remember this truth and hold fast to the love and goodness that comes from your just rule. We pray for this time now, where anxieties have been re-heightened, with the increasing coronavirus cases and the situation arising in Melbourne. We continue to pray for those who are sick or lonely through this time and pray that they will trust in you and receive the support that they need. We continue to pray for the development of a vaccine to decrease the virus's impact across the world. We thank you for the amazing efforts of our kids and youth leaders who have worked hard to continue bringing your word to young people during this time. We thank you for their ability to quickly adapt to leading online. We pray that as face-to-face -face youth plans to resume this term, that you will continue to use your servant leaders to proclaim your word and that more people will come to know you. As we start a new teaching series, we pray that your word will challenge us as we look through the book of Daniel. Thank you for the work of those who have put this series together and we pray that we will faithfully be guided in your word as we study it. As we begin to move from pre-recorded church to live streaming Sunday services, we pray that things will run smoothly in the transition 
and that by meeting in person, we will be better enabled to love, serve, and build each other up as a church. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, my name is Samantha, and I go to NC6. Tonight we'll be reading two passages. The first one is from Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia, and put in the treasure house of his God. Next we'll be reading from Psalm 137, verses 1 to 6. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There in the poplars we hung our harps, for our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Well, we're living through a pandemic, as if I need to tell you. And there are just so many uncertainties. There are, well, each time we listen to the news, will Gladys tell us something different? Uh, there's new numbers going up. Uh, there's Melbourne and there's Sydney outbreaks. Uh, will we get a, a, a warning from our app or from someone knocking on our doors to say we've been exposed and their contact tracing? And being exposed, are we going to asymptomatically spread it around or are we going to uh, contract uh, severe symptoms? And of course, there is so much suffering, so much pain, and no doubt the worst is not yet to come. Uh, and uh, if we look at the reports overseas, we just see such untold suffering. And it's right for us to ask, well, where's God in all this? Has he failed? Has he not cared? And when it comes to COVID, it's stripped away our, 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 our securities, our, our future prospects. It's stripped away so much from us. And we do ask that question, where is God? Well, we start a new series today. It's looking at Daniel and this term we'll be covering it. But today we're just looking at the first two verses. And we see there and it says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem to besiege it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands, along with some of the articles of the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Well, there is unfortunately a few strange names there. Uh, it can turn us off and we can sort of go, oh, I don't know if I want to read the rest of this book. And then, of course, there's so many other books and we do wonder whether it's worth going on. But what's clear about these two verses is that there is an assumption that we're meant to know the back story. There's something that's gone on and these names are attached to something before. And if we read the end of Two Kings, the last few chapters there, we see what's going on, what's assumed as we start off trying to understand Daniel. We've got to know our Bibles. We've got to know the God's big story to try and work out, well, what's, where's Daniel fitting in? And what's it saying to us? And well, who is Jehoiakim? Well, he's told to us, the king of Judah, and the people of God, God's chosen people, they originally were, ten, were 12 tribes. And the 10 northern tribes, they went off and they were uh, defeated by Assyria and scattered. They've been lost as we start off in Daniel because Jehoiakim is a southern king. The two southern tribes, 
uh, Judah and Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin was small, so it's just called Judah. Uh, here is one of the last kings uh, before the divided kingdom, before, well, as the kingdom divides and before they go into exile. And Jehoiakim, he's there and he's defeated by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylonia. Uh, the Babylonians, they were the superpower of the day. Uh, it, it's now modern Iraq, uh, but they, they were uh, all conquering in so many different stages uh, of God's people and the surrounding areas. And there's different deportations that are mentioned at the end of Two Kings. And Daniel's taken off in the first wave. And then later on, uh, the Jerusalem temple is destroyed. Well, this Nebuchadnezzar, he takes God's people into exile. And we see how shocking their suffering is as we look at one of the Psalms, say Psalm 137 that was read for us. And we read there, by the rivers of Babylon, so the, the fugitives are there taken off into, into captivity, they sat and they wept as they remembered Zion, or, or another name, Jerusalem. Uh, there on the poplar trees we hung our harps, and from there our captors asked us for a song. Our tormentors demanded us to sing songs of joy. They wanted to sing one of those sort of victory songs, ha, captives, uh, the, the Judahites or the Jews. And uh, they said, uh, sing one of those songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? There is the horror of exile. God's people are suffering. Mass people movements. We see those massive refugee camps of just people dislodged from their home. And we, we know the, the, more recently the Syrian refugees scattered across Europe and beyond. And we just see untold suffering time and time again. Well, God's people are suffering. But there's a deeper suffering to God's people. There's something that they know that makes their suffering sort of double loaded. Because they remember the promises given uh, in the back story, uh, the bigger story of God. They remember the promises given to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12. And it said there, I will make you, God says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And I will make your name great and you'll be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. And we see those promises uh, traced from Genesis chapter 12 through Abraham's descendants that, of course, became the people of God and these Judah people here and Daniel. And they know that they're meant to be blessed and even a blessing to all other nations. <laughs> but at the moment, they're cursed. They're suffering. And, well, the Babylonians, they're the blessed ones, but at the cost of God's people. And, of course, by cutting God out. So there's a deeper suffering for us uh, as God's people uh, when it comes to funeral of someone we know that doesn't believe in God, we have a double grief because, of course, we miss them now and we know that our relationship is finished with them on earth. But there's a deeper grief as we contemplate their judgment and the, the lack of blessings that has been promised to them. Well, God's people are suffering a double grief, a double suffering. And we ask the question, has God's big story failed? Has God failed in his big story? In those columns, we think, well, with the divided kingdom, and you'll see just down the bottom of that, that bar, there's Babylon down there. They've been taken into captivity to Babylon. And we think, is this it? Well, at the beginning of that captivity, we could say uh, with God's people then and there that they are defeated. And maybe there is no return from Babylon, although we can see in the diagram, of course, the story will go on. 
but at this stage they are suffering. But it's actually a suffering that isn't because God has failed. It's a suffering because God is in control and he has promised or, or prophesied that if you turn away from God, then you will suffer. You will suffer curse. And we see that in the book of Lamentations. It's a short five chapter book of, of laments. And we see there in chapter four, verse 11, the Lord has given full vent to his wrath. He has poured out his fierce anger. He kindled a fire in Zion that consumed her foundations. The kings of the earth did not believe, nor did any of the peoples of the world, that enemies and foes could enter the gates of Jerusalem. But it happened because of the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests who shed within her the blood of the righteous. And in chapter 5, you, Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures from generation to generation. Why do you always forget us? Why do you forsake us so long? Restore us to yourself, Lord, that we may return. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. Well, God's people, they deserved God's judgment. They deserved curse. They had been told by God. God is faithful to what he said. And they are now being judged. God can use a foreign nation or a foreign virus uh, to come and bring judgment on God's people. And for this generation, their sins were held to account in such a dramatic way and they were taken off into captivity. And there is still blessing. There is still a people that are allowed to return. But in so many ways, God's kingdom has been dismantled. God's people, well, they're not being blessed. They're not in God's place. They're not under God's rule. They're under foreign rule, the Babylonians. And we see there that they are actually under God's curse as promised. And for us, we need to take that warning that God is a fearful God. He is a God of wrath. Because he's righteous, he's angry at injustice. He's angry at us burning the hand that feeds us. He's angry at us not recognizing that life and life eternal comes from him and it's on offer. As the prophets also said, if you repent and come back to God, he will provide a way. But one day it will be too late. One day God will blow the full time whistle. One day there will be a judgment where this exile is just a little cameo picture of the final eternal judgment to come. And we realize that, well, then it will be too late. There will be no more swapping from curse to blessings through repentance, through God's provision to us. But what of that provision? How does God provide a get out of jail free card, the moral eternal jail of hell card? How on earth can we get out of that? And for God to remain justice, for God to remain just and oversee uh, our sins. How's it going to work? Well, there's a hint and a clue already for us in these first two verses of Daniel. Because we also see that God goes into exile. It's slightly sort of strange for us. But the articles of the temple, the furnishings and the, the tools of the temple, they're, they're elaborately covered in, and made out of gold and silver and bronze and all sorts of precious metals. And they, as we read, have been taken into captivity. 
we see there that God's temple, God's uh, symbolic throne room on earth, uh, we see that is now, well, placed under the Babylonian gods, placed in a Babylonian temple. We see that God himself goes into exile. And we wonder, why does God need to go into exile if he's, if he's punishing his people? Why would, why would God need to show that the, the trappings of him dwelling with his people, that that is now totally dismantled? Why would God decide to be seen to be humiliated uh, for that generation? To, to allow the Babylonians to think that they won and they beat Yahweh, God of gods. What is God doing? Why does he so much be humiliated and rejected? And for good reasons, the Babylonians won. Well, we see there that God goes into exile for our sakes. He wants to strip away the externals. Because if we rely on the trappings of Israel, we can forget that actually it's God himself that matters. We're to trust in God and his big story, his provision through promises and eventually through Jesus. We're to rely on what he's done, not on how impressive our temple may look in Jerusalem, how much gold and silver is found there. That's not at all the foundation of the security that God's people should have had. It's the promises of God. It's God himself. Yes, God dwelling with him, but God doesn't have to stay in that physical building in Jerusalem, and he didn't. And of course, it was taken off into captivity. But it's proof that God's prepared to be cursed alongside his people. He's prepared to go into exile, to stand with his people, to be no longer in Jerusalem with his people, but now in Babylon with his people. And he's going to work there for 70 years, work through Daniel. We're going to see that in the rest of the book of Daniel. And we're going to see that God is with his people, no matter what reputation it costs them or him. And he's going to be there. And of course, he has plans. He has a bigger story that goes way beyond the divided kingdom and the exile into Babylon. And we see God providing again and again. Well, in the end, Jesus Christ, who would be curse for his people, who in the end would stand with sinners and in the end take the place of sinners on that cross. We see there that Jesus was prepared to stand in our place, to take God's wrath as we deserved, to be judged, to be humiliated, to be rejected. And of course, in that suffering, it means that we don't need to suffer judgment to be punished for our sins. God could uphold his moral integrity and pay for sins, not by us who committed them, but by his son, Jesus on the cross. The essence of Christianity is stripping back the trappings to what God has done. It's not about, well, physically meeting in our building, as great as that would be. It's not about all the the external things of, of blessing of friendships, of finding, finding a spouse. It's not about all the other blessings that, of course, we love to have a network of Christians that still know each other, even though we haven't been in the building. It's a wonderful movement of God, but it's not to do with the externals. It's to do with what's going on in there, in your heart. It's what's going on of God relating to us. And whether we have a building that's ever opened again or not, whether it's going to be shut down for the next decade or not, we don't know. I don't know. Gladys doesn't know. The, the pandemic experts don't know. Whether we lose our lives, we don't know. 
These are hard times and it was hard for Daniel and God strips them back out of judgment. But he doesn't want judgment. He continues to offer forgiveness until that final day. He wants us to take the warning shots of the exile of the Old Testament, of the pandemic of our time, of many other sufferings, and to say this world is cursed. This world will not, in the end, offer us anything eternal. But there is a joy found in knowing God. So what are the things that we're to walk away from? Well, there's dangers. The final thing for me to say is there's dangers of living by sight, living for those externals, the trappings, rather than living by faith and trust in God. The externals, they're like training wheels that, are, that God gives us from time to time. But there is dangers. Uh, when those, those, those trappings, externals, the blessings, the immediate obvious blessings of being Christian, uh, when those trappings are obvious, the danger is that we can think that that's what Christianity is about. We can think that people should be ni- Christians should be nice to us and, and shouldn't be sinful to us, that they shouldn't gossip, they shouldn't stab us in the back, they shouldn't let us down. And we can think that somehow I'm meant to be sort of sinless or, or perfect or able to, to pastorally meet people profoundly. I wish I could. But even, even Jesus Christ wasn't considered that at, during his time. Uh, he was seen as someone who was missing the point so often, even by the 12. And we think when the trappings are obvious and we can shift our focus to them, and it's in the end going to be a very soft Christianity or maybe not Christianity at all. A convenient Christianity, a comfortable Christianity, a consumer Christianity if I'm liking it at the time. And we can come to back into the building for social reasons, for what I get out of it, rather than what I can give and the Christians that are there to serve and maybe some people that aren't yet Christian. And the trappings can so cover our eyes and take us away from the main game. When they sell you a car, you can sort of go, oh, wow. You can look at this this latest, greatest electronic feature of how it can manipulate and talk to your phone in better ways than your phone can do to itself. And you can miss that it's a lemon under the bonnet. Well, the main engine room of God, in fact, the whole engine room of everything that matters, in the end is what the exiles have over in Babylon, as God is with them and as their hearts turn to him and they take the warning shots, then 70 years later, we know that they're to be restored. And an eternity later, 10,000 years and then forever, we will be blessed by God. Well, the second danger is that when those trappings are removed and we can get angry at God, We can sort of feel as if Christianity is just not satisfying at all. And in the end, we can go, we can go for other things to fill those superficial, satisfying moments for us. We can invest in, well, the church isn't doing it for me. Uh, The trappings aren't what they used to be. It's not as exciting as it used to be. In fact, I'm quite comfortable at home in my slippers on my lounge. And we can think, well, I'm not going to keep putting out for Christianity. I'm going to invest in, in my shed, in my electronic shed, in making money, spending money, gaining experiences, finding friendship, all sorts of ways that we can look for all sorts of other things that satisfy us. And, well, this can expose us of what really matters to us when things are removed. What's Daniel going to think as everything is removed. And the third danger for us is when the trappings can come and go. And we can say to God, look, if these trappings come, defined by us, comfortable consumer sort of us, if these, if these trappings come, then that's when I'll be on your side. I'll, I'll invest in you. But as soon as they go... 
I'm not going to. And I feel morally justified because you're not satisfying me. And we can know better than God. We can know all sorts of ways of holding God to ransom and justifying it. It's the great dangers of those trappings. But God, in his great love for the people of the Old Testament, in his great love for us, strips them bare. So that you look at what is eternal. What has God says that matters into forever? And what has Christ done to secure that for us? And those exiles, they would have to wait until Christ. We're all the more blessed because we can look back and see how God is dealing with curse and dealing with curse, not just for a generation, but forever and ever. COVID has stripped us of so many freedoms, so many externals, uh, the, the physical church in, in from, for many of us for many months. It stripped us of possible health future and financial future. But in that stripping, it exposes our hearts, what matters to us, what we're invested in. And some of us are going to flourish in these last few months and will continue to do so. Some of us don't mind such dramatic changes and uncertainty. But for others, life is hard. Our, our mental state is hard. Our prospects financially and health wise. And if we catch this virus, we could die. There is so much testing for us and stripping back of what's really at stake for us. What matters most if I don't get to that goal that I want to get to in a few months time? If, if I don't work out that that life's not going to be what I want it to be. If what was all planned is now up for grabs. Well, it's going to be hard. We're going to have to invest in what matters. We're going to have to be disciplined as Christians. We're going to have to keep putting ourselves out as safely as possible, but indeed putting ourselves out for others. We're going to have to get used to change. We're going to have to keep trying to link with people and not, not just not just sort of uh, uh, on the surface, but deep, uh, and, and trying to do it in a way that doesn't suffocate people, uh, trying to be consistent with it, trying to, to gather the people that, that aren't flourishing at this time, that, are, that are, are, are floundering and stagnating in their Christian growth, to try and bring them back. And for the rest of Daniel, uh, we're going to see how Daniel does that, how he survives under foreign occupation, how he survives with no more trappings left. And we're going to learn many, many lessons throughout this term. I'm really looking forward uh, to Daniel.
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in Him be found, dressed in His righteousness alone. Faultless stand before the throne. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, Andy, that brings us to the end of the last week of this sort of format of NC6. Um, it's been really, really fun um, figuring out ways to stay in contact and continue uh, to worship God together throughout these times. Uh, and as we move into the next phase, I'm sure we'll continue to do that. Um, so just two point outs for this week. Um, as always, connect slips. Make sure you're doing those. It's really, uh, really great um, for us to be able to stay in contact with everyone and know how you're all doing, especially... Um, in times where it's really easy to f feel um, mm. like disconnected and um, yeah, and sort of scattered. So it's really important to be doing that. Um, Look at you, Callum. Yeah, Callum, make sure you actually do them. Um, it's really important. So yeah, be sure you're doing those every week. And the second thing is, like we said before, we're going back in person next week. Um, so there's already a few people at church right now. Andy and I are probably there right now. Uh, but next week, the, uh, the numbers are currently looking like about 60 people will be able to come. Um, so make sure you're registering online. Um, if you're able to come back, it'll be so great to see you all again um, as we'll be doing our semi-normal service. Um, but if you are, obviously, there's only 62 people coming. So if you aren't able to come um, or if you don't feel comfortable coming or uh, you've got people who you live with that um, obviously might be at risk, then obviously it's super important that we're still uh, social distancing and, and loving each other by taking care of each other. Mm -hmm. um, so we are still live streaming church. Um, it'll just be... Uh, camera that's filming the service as we go. Um, so all the links are the same. You don't have to do anything different. Um, the way that you access church now is the way you'll access it next week. Um, if you aren't going to be coming in person, obviously it won't be uh, as polished and edited, but it will be nice that we'll be able to see each other all together in person as we slowly get back to normal. Yeah, seriously. Uh, well, yeah, that wraps up tonight. But yeah, today we've, tonight we've seen how good a term we have ahead. We're going to be looking into Daniel uh, and seeing who the king of all kingdoms is and kind of learning about that. And yeah, I just pray that we, it's changing our hearts every day. Mm. Uh, yeah. We just want to thank James for that great talk and have a great week going out and serving. If you haven't made Daniel, tell him that you learn about him. Uh, not him, but Daniel in the Bible. <laughs> Chat to him about it. Chat to all your mates and you get them to know Jesus as well. Yeah. yeah. All right. See you later.